I'm uh, here to talk to you about, I think, a difficult conversation, one that uh, often is associated with a lot of the goblins that uh, we don't often talk about when we think about a city or think about what goes on or what's necessary in order to make a city, to borrow the phrase, great for everyone. Those goblins are like homelessness and poverty and, and uh, addictions and mental health. And as Jonathan indicated, my personal area of interest is the whole domestic violence issue. Some of you may know that uh, domestic violence uh, impacts about uh, 16,000 people in this city every year. That's the police are going to those calls. That's 43 a day, 365 days of the year. That, we have the second highest rate of domestic violence reported instance in the country. And to me, that's why we need to talk about this issue in this city, because that's unacceptable in a place that has such abundance. And for most of us, we don't have to see every day but I'm telling you it comes into our homes every day. This is an ugly issue. This is an uncomfortable issue. And I really want to give you a, a, a small experience of what our frontline responders like the police and some of our staff deal with every day. And so uh, this is a clip. This is actually a real event, but we've, we've uh, made it Hollywood eyes and took it out of context. But I just want you to share, share it with you. You're doing a real good job on your picture. Coffee. Please. I'd like some more too, please. Sure. She spilled my coffee. I'm sorry, sir. You fucking bitch. I'll bring a little coffee. How do you like that? Stop it! You wouldn't get away with it here. You won't get away with it at home. Now, Stats Canada tells us that there are 32,000 other incidents that will never come to the attention of the police. Many of them look just like that. This is why we need to talk about that. Many of you are probably feeling assaulted, abused. I've inflicted something upon you that is uncomfortable, maybe makes you angry, maybe makes you very uncomfortable, scared for some people. And I did that intentionally because I want you to understand what it's like for many of the people who are living in these homes and many of the children who grew up in these homes. These are the same feelings that they carry with them every day. They bring them into our workplaces. They bring it into our schools. They bring it into our communities. They bring it into our living rooms. And imagine what it's like to walk around with that every day and then you know, have these conversations going on about how what a wonderful and great city this is. It's a hard thing to reconcile in your head. You know, we've, this domestic violence isn't new. We've been talking about this issue for, well, probably since the day that we came together as little amoeba. We heard about microbiology here earlier, right? And Ray started raising children. This has been with us a long time. And why haven't we figured it out? Our own health service says this is a preventable injury. And yet this continues to go on 43 times a day, every day. In fact, we just had a domestic homicide that's in the newspaper today. Uh, a young mom and uh, her young child uh, were killed. So it puzzles me. You know, we put a man on the moon, but we can't fix this. And one of the things that I think it gets in our way is that we have a paradigm that we walk around with, especially when we think about our social problems in, in our communities. And we think about them in very simple ways. And kind of like this romance novel that's being pictured here, this, this paradigm plays out in a lot, of our, uh, uh, a lot of our literature, a lot of our movies, and we love it. We cling to it because it's really simple. And this plot line goes like this. We have this idyllic setting. And then some evildoer comes in and disrupts that setting. And then a shirtless Fabio comes walking in and saves the day, rescues the damsel, and everybody goes off and lives happily ever after. Well, except for the bad guy, he's been dispatched horribly. But that paradigm gets applied over and over again. And we have been doing the same thing when we think about domestic violence. We are looking for the hero that we can insert into a home who will save the day. And why? Because we can neatly uh, you know, wipe our hands and say, well, that's fixed. And we can go on to something new and not have to worry about that. Well, we've been inserting heroes for a long time. And, I, and lots of these heroes are successful. I mean, that's the, that's the joy of those stories for us. Right? We've, we've built women's shelters. We've changed the policing laws. We've made a, the courts more effective and responsive to this issue. And it's had an impact. As this slide on domestic homicides show, we've reduced the rate of homicides 
uh, for the last two decades. But again, the point being is that it's not zero. And if we were truly being effective and applying effective solutions, I would suggest that we can get that to zero. If Alberta Health Services is right, and we know that might be dicey, uh, <laughs> you know, if it is truly a preventable injury, this should be able to go to zero. So what gets in the way? I want to bring this home by sharing a story about a little, uh, a little uh, boy that I know. Uh, his name is Cole. And Cole's story starts like most of ours started. Mom and dad met, fell in love, moved in together. Cole short, was born shortly after that. And then their story starts to take a little bit of a turn. It turns sour. And they start fighting and arguing, the yelling at each other. Dad uh, starts working more. He starts drinking more with his buddies after work, coming home intoxicated. He sometimes is berating mom and, and ask, accusing her of she having an affair, she's doing bad things. Uh, mom is at home. She's tired. She's stressed. She's raising a young child. Uh, and, but she has this value that a home, is, a home for her child will have a mom and a dad inside of it. And so she's working hard to keep that and make it work. And then there's Cole. Cole's a happy little kid. He loves life, and he loves his mom and dad. Unfortunately, things got really bad in this house. And on, uh, uh, in July of 2002, dad came home, confined mom in a, in a room, assaulted her numerous times, and strangled her to unconsciousness by sticking his fist into her mouth and closing off her airway from the inside. She was eventually able to get out and phone the police. And our police service, and, I don't, and I'm not intending to pick on our police service, but their best on this day was not good enough. They came, they listened to her story, and they didn't believe everything that they heard because they couldn't imagine how you could actually, a large man, stick his fist into a small woman's mouth and actually physically make that happen without having serious injuries around her, her face. This didn't seem possible, so they started not believing her story. And she was very calm when she was presenting to them, and she didn't seem all upset and excited like you would assume someone who was a victim of violence would be. And so then they started questioning, is this really true? Did this really happen? And so they didn't really do a great job with her. They didn't leave behind resources. They didn't invite her uh, or, or bring in outside services to help her. And where I think we really failed for her is we also, as service providers, sat back and we insisted, as we have historically, that she come to us. And she had to come to a whole number of us and tell her story individually to each one of our organizations without ever knowing whether any one of us would help her. We re, we've re-victimized her when we make her do that. Needless to say, mom is a very strong and resourceful person and she persevered and she and Cole left that relationship. She got a restraining order against dad. She got a, a custody and access order which prevented dad from uh, seeing Cole unless he completed some counseling and then he had to do his see Cole uh, in his supervised visits. And uh, he was charged, uh, but he pled guilty, and his trial was set for 18 months down the road. So in the meantime, in those 18 months, Dad is doing everything that the court has asked him to. He's going to his counseling, he's doing his treatment, uh, he's doing his supervised visits, and all the reports that are coming back is that, hey, Dad's doing a great job. And so Dad takes the next step, and he applies to have his, the unsupervised, or to access coal unsupervised, and he's, get, he's granted that. And... So as part of one of those unsupervised visits, and this is Cole, uh, dad plans a trip with Cole out to uh, see his grandparents. And this is a joyous day for Cole and his grandparents because they haven't seen each other in probably more than a year because mom and dad have been fighting for that long. And it's a monumental day for dad because he gets to have unsupervised visits and unsupervised time with his son. So the day comes, uh, mom is a little worried and anxious that Cole isn't at home, but dad uh, picks him up, takes him up to, the, up to his grandparents and they have a great day. And he phones mom about an hour before he's due to drop Cole back off. And he's a little tearful, but he's telling her what a great day they've had and how uh, wonderful it was to see Cole and his grandparents together and how much fun they had. And then he ends the conversation by saying, but I can't do this anymore. And you're gonna have to send somebody to pick us up. And then he hung up. Mom panics, rightfully so. She doesn't know what he means by what he's just said here, but she knows that something wrong is happening. She phones the police. Of course, the police response is, we can't help you because they haven't been missing for 24 hours. So she sits anxiously and then gets the worst call that a mother could ever have. Cole is found dead with, her, with his dad 
on a halfway home, uh, or halfway home on the side of the road. Dad has shot himself and killed Cole. Now this is a terrible story, but I find it a hopeful story because Cole is a little boy who's taught me so much and he's given me so much and I wanna share with you some of those lessons. The first lesson is that domestic violence is not a simple problem. And I think you hopefully heard or started to peel away some of the onions that make it so complex by Cole's story. The second piece is that we can't do it alone and no one can cope with this alone. And if you think about Cole's dad, he's not a very sympathetic character in this story, but how alone would you have to be to take your own life and make the fateful decision to take your son with you? And the third lesson, and the one I want to spend the most time on and most relevance to here, is that inside a Cole's story is the message that it takes a village to raise a child. And Cole, I think, is a pretty bright kid because I think he's right. And I think he's really challenging us to think about what are we as a city and how are we going to make sure that the coals of the world don't happen again. He's challenging us to raise our level of consciousness like Einstein here and I understand that this isn't a simple problem but it's a complex one. And in order to solve a complex one, we need to think about complex solutions in order to meet the need that's required to stop and end this issue of domestic violence. And so I'm proud to tell you that, and Jonathan gave us a great introduction, uh, about there's an organization called Homefront, which really isn't an organization, it's a collective of services, many of which are on this screen here, that has come together and, and listened to Cole's story and said, this is no longer acceptable. We can no longer continue to work in silos. We must break down those silos and begin to develop complex solutions that can help the Coles and the families that are like Coles in the world. So this was an agency that started way back in 1990, or an organization, an idea that started back in 1990 and, and became real in May of 2000. And all of these partners came together and we challenged ourselves that what we've been doing for the last 75 years is not acceptable. But we had to come up with something meaningful. Well, what was the next step? And the next step is this idea of deep collaboration. Not just working side by side or more closely together or you know, getting to know your neighbor. We're talking deep, intimate, knowledge of one another as service system providers. We're talking building a micro village that will go out and make a difference for these families. We do that by challenging those old paradigms. Remember that, you know, the, the romance paradigm I shared with you? Well, we've broken that piece up and said that, that doesn't apply anymore. And by that, we're going out into homes now with true multidisciplinary teams that are actually arriving at people's homes together and trying to intervene with the wealth of services that come with it. We're not letting any one individual or service say it's all your responsibility at this point because that creates those gaps in our community. The other piece that we're doing is we're sharing information. One of the big bugbears that we talk about in our society all the time is privacy and confidentiality. Well, that applies to you and I in safe and normal everyday environments. But when you're at risk and when there is violence happening, those rules don't apply anymore. And we have buried ourselves, barriered ourselves, and stopped sharing information, which just furthers the gaps between our services. We're breaking those down. What, in essence, we've done is recreated this village, we've made that micro village. We're not allowing ourselves to do it alone and we're going to the clients and we're sticking with them until they don't need us anymore, rather than forcing them to come to us and tell their stories multiple times. So if I'm in this audience, I'd be sitting there going, well, those are all nice big words and that's really fancy and that's very transformative, but does it work? And the truth is that our imperfect results so far have produced this. And the answer is a resounding yes. We're reducing the number of reoffense rates uh, for domestic violence. We're reducing the total homicides. We are, have more people coming forward and asking for help every day, and we are providing extended and enhanced services to them so that they don't become the coals of the future. Together, we are stronger, and that's what this shows. But all of Cole's lesson, the complete lesson, is that it takes an entire village to raise a child. My previous slide that I had about 60 agencies up there, well, that's just a small subsection of the entire resource and wealth and re of people and time and, and treasure that we have in this community that can make a difference. And we need to mobilize more and more of that. Because you remember that 32,000 I talked about that, that suffer in silence? We can't help them unless we know about them. But guess who does? All of us. 
And, if I, and again, I have this question if I'm in the audience going, oh, don't ask me to help here. But it doesn't have to be that complicated, right? This is, a, this is extending the conversation that we've had ongoing all day today and will continue on. It's about participating and creating a village. And you do that, we heard about Mark Hopkins and his bubbles, right? It's about knowing your neighbors, being a friend, reaching out and asking questions. Simple things, lend an ear and believe what you heard. Extend the question even further. Instead of just how, how are you doing, is ask one more question. Are you okay? How are you doing today? Can I help you? Do you need me for anything? These are simple ways to engage people on a much deeper level and you never know what's gonna come out. And that's always the scary part is what is gonna come out terrifies people and it often stops us from asking that extra question. But I'm here to tell you that in a 2.0 city, a great city, you don't have to have all the answers. All of us have the answer, and we will come and we want to come and help. What else can you do? Well, you can make this a conversation that we're all having. That 32,000, those 32,000 people don't necessarily know that they're allowed to come forward, or they may just think this is normal. And one of the things you could do is take Cole's story and pass it on. The grapevine effect in, is amazingly resourceful and helpful and freeing for people who are in these relationships. To know that you don't have to live like this and that there is help is wonderfully powerful news. The other piece, you can make it part of our political discourse. You know, in this province, we have this wonderful economic debate and discussion that's going on uh, about, you know, government getting out of our pockets and reducing spending and all that wonderful stuff. But you know what we don't hear very often is the flip side of that is they're going to cut, and that's okay. But then as a village, we need to step back and say, if we're telling government not to do these things, like provide these services, who will? And I'll tell you who will, it has to be us. And we have to make that part of that large P political discourse to figure out how do we balance the fiscal re responsibilities of this province and the social responsibilities that we have for all the families. So Cole's lessons are, are many. I've shared a few. His key one is it takes a village to raise a child. I've given you some evidence that says that it's successful when we work together. And the challenge today, or the invitation today, is that we want to uh, spread that conversation. We want to have that full discussion about how do we make this a city that steps forward as a 2.0 city that's willing to take care of all of those people that are in need in our community. And I would invite you after today at the break, come talk to me, talk amongst yourselves, but I, I invite you to think about how will you extend Cole's legacy? In what way might you contribute? Thank you.